tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Best Fiends. Listen guys, we all know what it's like to have our faces buried in our phones. It's something we see more and more of each day, and there are no signs of it stopping. That's why I want to tell you about one of my favorite mobile games from the App Store, Best Fiends. Look, you're going to be on your phone anyway. Why not engage in an activity that's fun as well as a brain challenge? If you still haven't played Best Fiends, we need to have a little discussion. For all you listeners already on board, you're excused. You already know how excellent Best Fiends is. You've already been acquainted with the pleasures of Match 3 or more puzzlery. I'm on level 78, and the sky's the limit, baby! Best Fiends is a game for everyone, and if there's one thing everyone loves to do, it's matching puzzles. In Best Fiends, you match three or more like items on your puzzle board to deal delicious devastation to the slugs, the bad guys, using your army of evolving fiends, the good guys. As you progress, you'll build your team of fiends, unlock achievements, and solve increasingly harder puzzles the more you advance. There are thousands of levels, each with new challenges and achievements, and raising level after level, you can't help but feel that the fiends are our little buddies that need help. Also, what's even better is that it's always available on my phone. There's no data or Wi-Fi required to play. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 21 of Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and we have something very special for you this evening. Tonight's story is the first of a four-part series of stories from one of our most beloved authors, Nick Carlson. The lovely folks at Temple Dark Books Publishing bring you his newest book titled Hell's Gulf. Rowan Vane, a wannabe writer with the confidence of a leaf in a hurricane, is on a soul-searching vacation with his damaged family in Hell's Gulf, a ramshackle, no-horse stain on Florida's reputation. You might be forgiven for asking why he'd go there, but forgiveness isn't much of a commodity amongst the denizens of this godforsaken place. They have a bit of an axe to grind. 
With a history as dark and pungent as its waters, this bit too quiet beach town in the navel of nowhere is patrolled by a delightfully xenophobic sheriff who sees foreign agents arriving on every rotten jetty. This picturesque town boasts abandoned ghostly ruins, unusually amorous sea life, mutant creatures, and dastardly deeds that form the stories of the town's affable alcoholics. Oh, and something's been killing the people there for decades. Yes, folks, Hell's Gulf really has it all. All you need is a little imagination. Fortunately, Rowan's brought his along with all the bells and whistles. And some fishing tackle. Stay tuned to the end of the show to find out how to win a paperback copy of this book, as well as the information needed to buy one for yourself. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all of our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. This episode of Horror Hill is brought to you by Moriarty, an Audible original. Now folks, it's no secret that I'm one of the best around when it comes to hearing original horror fiction, but it does sometimes leave me yearning for the tales of old that I grew up with. There are so many story and plot lines built into alternate universes with unfeatured dimensions. If only they could bring back one of the old classics with a fresh new perspective. Forget the remakes. I'm talking about things that take the characters we grew up with and spin them on their heads. That's why I was so pleased to discover Moriarty, an original brought to you by Audible. Moriarty is a new addition to the Sherlock Holmes universe, one that asks the forbidden question, what if Sherlock Holmes' most villainous nemesis was actually an innocent man. Don't miss the new Audible original, Moriarty, The Devil's Game. Visit audible.com slash listen to Moriarty and listen now. That's listen to Moriarty, M-O-R-I-A-R-T-Y. All one word, folks. Big thanks to Audible for partnering with us today. We can't wait to hear what you come up with next. And now, from author Nick Carlson, I give you The Plague Ship. Jonah Daughtry's heart skipped a beat when the simulation played out in its entirety. Not only was he certain that the prize was there, tangibly, tantalizingly there, but that he would be able to get to it first. Jonah scarcely saw breaks so fortuitous in his ten years of marine salvaging. Whenever a seagoing vessel ran aground or sank, it was almost always local salvagers that tracked it down first, leaving him with a mere cut of the profits, or the scraps, or nothing at all. Despite his years of experience and his technology, He often found himself on the tail end of a desperate, hungry convoy converging on the spot, good to lend a hand, but rarely to claim first finder's rights. This time was different, though. 
Jonah had earned the nickname The Reaper for his hawkish monitoring of vessels passing through the Gulf of Mexico. Sitting alone in his cabin, his radios all tuned to the proper frequencies, he would wait and listen out for distress calls from nearby boats. Whenever panicked SOSs came through, he would mark down their coordinates and inscribe all relevant details and… wait. By cross-examining their locations with currents and weather patterns in the area and plugging them into a computer simulator, he could deduce where an abandoned ship would go down or float off to. It helped him in getting there, but almost never in getting there first. Watching the simulation play out again, this time Jonah was more confident he would get there first. Recent legislation had rendered it more difficult to outsource traditional Mexican shrimpers on work visas, so Floridian shrimp trawlers have had to settle with inexperienced crewmates, sometimes far beyond their typical geographic reach, to fill in the gaps. A development Jonah had been monitoring closely. Inattentive workers in high-stress conditions could only lead to disaster, and the Job 2-7 was no exception. Birthed in Sarasota, Jonah had picked up the shrimp trawler's distress calls as she drifted northwest up towards the armpit of Florida. Communication went dark around 29.3 north, 84.6 west. Jonah's subsequent calculation showed that by now, the ship would have drifted towards an obscure backwater town along Florida's forgotten coast. It was only 20 miles from his current location. Jonah gunned the motors and banked his tugboat east, sharing a private laugh with himself regarding the town's unfortunate name, Hell's Gulf. The Job 2-7 would have been impossible to miss, a white and red 65-footer adorned with its signature outriggers. Morning light slowly bled over the sky as Jonah and his first mate, Esteban Chauvet, cruised south alongside the forested shores of Hell's Gulf. The sun had scarcely risen, but already there was an oppressive mugginess to the sea air. The mixed conifer and oak woods were silent, apart from the occasional passing seagull. Even over a hundred feet offshore, biting midges managed to find them, and the two men had to retreat to the cabin amid the invisible blood-sucking cloud. Consulting a map, Jonah determined that they had already scoured over a quarter of the area's shoreline, yet there was no other vessel in sight, no sign of human presence anywhere at all. This place is weird, Esteban commented, swatting at a stray no see Feels like we just sailed back to the Jurassic period. Hell's Gulf is one of those unincorporated communities, I read, said Jonah, peering out at the horizon. Got one hell of a reputation for itself, too. Killings, hate crimes, disappearances. You know, the works. Christ, Esteban muttered, shaking his head. Why don't they just carpet bomb the place? Jonah shrugged. Guess no one cares about a bunch of murderous hicks as long as they keep to themselves. Esteban opened his mouth to respond, but instead grimaced and resumed his vigil. The boat chugged along in silence until they found the trawler. There, Esteban announced, pointing to his left at the shoreline. The Job 2-7's stern stuck out from behind a sandy peninsula. Jonah cut the engines and they coasted to an idle speed, observing the beached vessel. The trawler's outriggers had fully extended, resembling the broken ribs of a massive whale. Its nets hung torn and tattered like cobwebs entombing the boat to its nautical grave. No visible signs of hull damage, said Jonah, looking at it through a pair of binoculars. Seems like they deliberately ran aground. See anyone? Esteban asked. Jonah left the cabin an inch towards the port railing, scoping it closer. Nobody, he finally said. Maybe they went into town to look for help. Well, if they're still alive and barring some status report, we can't just swoop right in and strip the boat, said Esteban. That'd make us looters. 
We'll anchor off here and wait to see if anyone shows up, said Jonah. As morbid as it sounded, he'd have preferred a missing in action crew to streamline the salvaging process. Living crewmates were nothing more than a nuisance, a brick wall in his path to getting paid. Even if the vessel in question were out of commission, arguments regarding where to take it, how to handle it, and even whether to salvage it at all were inevitable. Jonah scanned the surrounding beach, its sand tombstone gray in the early morning light. Huh, he said. The tide was lowering, so any footsteps in the sand ought to have been preserved, yet none led away from the ship. The sun blotted out for an instant, and Jonah lowered the binoculars to see a black vulture circling above. Like a haggard ghost, it floated down and landed unsteadily atop the starboard outrigger before hunching over and picking at something in the net. Jonah repositioned the binoculars and focused on the vulture, jabbing its beak into a folded clump of netting. The material tore open and something pale and limp flopped out. He drew in a sharp breath, nearly dropping the binoculars. We're going over there he announced. There's a dead body. Their skiff slid onto the beach with a hiss, and the two men jumped out, dragging it up beyond the high tide line. Up close, the Job 2-7 was a daunting, shadowy colossus, reeking of spoiled shrimp and rust. They stared in repulsion at the vulture, indifferent to their presence, as it pecked at the human arm protruding from the net. Fucking hideous, Esteban said lowly, shaking his head. Jonah grimaced. He had seen his share of dead bodies, mostly from ill-equipped vessels taken under by stormy weather. Rich, poor, experienced, or novice, it didn't matter to the sea, whose harsh post-mortem cleanse stripped corpses of hair and bloated them with salt water. The sea consumed all. It never gave quarter. Still, he hadn't quite gotten used to the sight. What if we find more bodies on board? Esteban asked, covering his nose. Well, wrap them in shrouds, Jonah answered. We have to get up on deck first. His standard procedure was to clear out a salvaged ship of any loose goods and transfer them to his own vessel before tugging it out. Loose ropes hung down from the port outrigger. He grabbed hold and rappelled up the side of the trawler. All that time in the army paid off, I guess, he thought. Thankfully, his first mate was no pushover physically either. Esteban rappelled up with him. Apart from the smell, the vessel was pristine. No indication of any trouble, anything that would have forced the crew to abandon ship. The presence of a body was another kink in the confounding equation. Were they attacked? Stricken down? Walking up towards the bow, they found their next body. The man had apparently perished gripping onto the railing, as if trying in vain to hoist himself back up. Jonah donned a pair of work gloves and approached. The corpse appeared unbroken, nothing to suggest he couldn't stand on his own. He reached over and grasped the man's sodden shoulder, turning him face up. Shit! He cursed, jumping away. The victim's nose and lips were charcoal black. Two swollen lumps protruded in his neck, and his fingertips had similarly darkened. Esteban! He called out. They were afflicted with something. Like a disease? Jesus! Esteban sputtered looking around. I don't want them to infect me. They won't infect you unless you stick a finger in their mouths and suck on it, said Jonah, turning his back on the body. But be extremely careful if you see another body. They're biohazards now, not under our purview. What disease could wipe out an entire crew at once like this? Esteban asked, peering up at the vulture. I don't know. Jonah replied, nor do I want to. He paced about the deck, wringing his hands and thinking. Despite the calm, 
The ship felt like a bomb primed to go off beneath his feet. No salvage before this had instilled such an uneasy air of mystery or of imminent danger. Let's make this quick, he decided. Keep the gathering of goods to a minimum and let's focus on getting this thing winched up when the tide comes in. Continue scouring the deck, I'll head down below. Esteban nodded and hurried towards the stern. Jonah wrenched the cabin door open and found a hatch leading down below decks. There, the smell of shrimp was at its strongest. A few dim lamps mounted on the walls revealed a narrow corridor with two doors on each side, the fish hold at its far end. As he descended the steps, cockroaches scuttled away noisily, disappearing between doors or through cracks in the walls. God, Jonah whispered, closing his eyes and bracing himself. Just look through the doors, see if there's anything worth saving. He tried the first door on his left. It revealed rows of life jackets and ring buoys, nothing he felt a need to save. Jonah crossed the hall to the first door on the right. He opened it, took a glance inside, and immediately slammed it shut. He escaped the worst of the odor, but it still smacked him before dissipating. The room, what he presumed to be a latrine, had been crusted over with dried fluids, resulting in a vile miasma with a hint of antiseptic. Jonah staggered back against the wall, breathing into the crook of his arm, willing the bile back down his throat. He felt dirty, polluted, having inhaled those spiteful fumes into his body. The old belief that disease was passed on through bad smells in the air suddenly seemed credible. No, he told himself. Just check the other doors and get a move on. Once he had succeeded in keeping his stomach contents down, Jonah moved on to the furthest door on the left. He sighed with relief. It was a storage closet packed with first aid kits, freeze-dried meals, laden oil cans, stuff that could be saved and resold. A few roaches clung to the walls, antennae slowly probing the air, but Jonah shooed them away and began pulling containers off their shelves. Scratch, scratch. He paused. It had been less of a sound and more of a feeling of a sound of psychic sand trickling down the back of his neck. Scratch. Scratch. No, he definitely heard it this time. Ship rats and other vermin were familiar presences on Rex, but the Job 2-7 couldn't have been beached for longer than several hours. Could rats have made it their home in that short a span? Somehow, Jonah doubted it. Regardless, he wasn't opening the final door, the source of the skin-crawling noises. Pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together. No reason to intentionally let potential plague rats out into the open. He glanced at the door to the fish hold. There was equally no reason to venture into its putrid depths. He paused. Had it always been cracked open? He couldn't remember. He hadn't looked at it too closely upon his entering below decks. It wasn't protocol to leave the door to a fish hold ajar. There had to have been a reason. Someone strayed inside, or stored something deep within it. Jonah hesitated. Then, with a reluctant groan, inched towards the fish hold and peeked through the crack. The odor of rotten shrimp was a relentless assault, one that bitterly discolored the very air around him. Jonah procured a washcloth from his pocket and pressed it to his nose and mouth, pulling the door open and taking a step inside. It swung loosely on its hinges thanks to the trawler's angle. Darkness swallowed the fish hole's interior. Jonah pulled out his flashlight and switched it on. Discarded shrimp and fish littered the slippery floor, but otherwise the fish hold appeared empty. White insulated bins lined the side walls. It was only by tilting the light up did Jonah see the third body. 
He too had been ravaged by the swollen blackness. He had pressed himself against the far wall, as close to the ventilation fans as possible, presumably to temper the blistering fever that had overtaken him. That's when the door slammed shut. Fuck! Jonah hissed, wheeling around and nearly slipping. He forced himself against the door, feeling around for a handle. No avail. He looked around the hinges for the emergency release. Esteban! He shouted, banging on the metal. Hey! Open the door! The bins behind him began to rattle. Jonah turned around again, the beam of light trembling in his hands as they bucked back and forth, as if rocked by a giant phantom hand. The lids exploded and shrimp poured out, much more than they should have feasibly held. A lava surge of slimy, reeking bodies, sliding over each other in a flowing heap, flooding the floor and rising quickly. Panicking, the smell piercing his nose, Jonah fumbled around until he found what he was looking for, a rubber button the size of his fist, and punched it. The fishhole door burst open and he fell out into the corridor on an encroaching wave of shrimp. Cold shells and hair-like feelers clung to his skin as he scrambled to get up, the taste of brine and death in his mouth, stinging his eyes. He lunged forward and pushed on the door. It jammed on a backlog of shrimp. Jonah forced it closed, crushing countless little bodies, their fleshy guts squeezing between the cracks, until the door clunked shut. You may find yourself thinking, what in the hell is a fiend? Well, let me tell you. Fiend, noun, a mythical, mischievous little creature inhabiting the world of Minutia. I love collecting all of the fiends and watching the changes throughout the ages and stages. I must admit I'm kind of partial to Pop, the passionate purple axolotl. We've been through a lot together, me and my guy Pop. Your fiends begin the game as babies. But as you blast through levels to defeat the dirty slugs, they evolve and become more powerful. With the keys and gold you earn, you can upgrade them and enhance their powers. And matching three is merely the minimum, friends. Take it from me, there's nothing like stringing together a mile of strawberries to unleash a torrent of attacks on the baddies. It even has a name, Slugmageddon. Best Fiends has something for everyone. I love to challenge my brain with activities and puzzles. However, I've heard of others that love the game because of how adorable the characters are. And it's not your typical match three either. You can match up ways, down ways, diagonally, around corners, etc. <laughs> it's so cool. And as I mentioned earlier, due to no Wi-Fi restrictions, I can play literally anywhere. That was a huge bonus for me personally. Also. No shame in playing in the bathroom. After all, everyone does it. Take a break from social media for an hour or two, put that selfie stick down, and head over to your app store to download Best Fiends today. That's Best Fiends. Like friends, but without the R. So what's the holdup, folks? Best Fiends is free to download, so you can join me and 100 million others who've taken the path to becoming Match 3 Masters. You'll be glad you did. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. Again, that's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Thank you for your support, fellow fiends, and for supporting the sponsors that make this show possible. He sprung to his feet, wiping shell fragments and shrimp juice off his front. He cursed, realizing he had dropped his flashlight somewhere amid the crustaceous deluge behind the door. I'm done, he gasped. Esteban, he shouted up the corridor. 
Forget the salvage. This vessel's fucked to high heaven. Ready the skiff and... He froze. Instead of a set of stairs, the front end of the corridor simply ended with a solid, inert wall. Jonah strode up to it and felt across its metal surface, finding no hinges or locks. It was as if it had always been there. Esteban! He yelled, pounding on the wall. It produced no reverb. His voice died immediately against its surface. He was essentially soundproofed. Cold, scratchy nerves flared under his skin. He pivoted and paced the enclosed hallway, thinking in delirious circles. Something structural within the ship groaned. It was joined by the familiar sound of scratching. Jonah regarded the far right door, the scratching seeming to beckon him. This is fucked up, he whispered, heading for the door. The noises became louder, more excited, the closer he drew. The instant his hand touched the handle, the scratching stopped. Jonah drew his tactical knife. He sighed before squeezing the handle and forcing it open. The sight before him nearly made him laugh, a desperate laugh of misery and rising apprehension. Beyond the door was a carbon copy of the same corridor, the same four rooms, two on each side, the entrance to a fish hold sitting at its end. What is this? Jonah lingered in the doorway, his vision tunneling. The dimensions were impossible. The duplicate corridor would have jutted from the trawler's starboard side. He took a tentative step forward. His reverberating footsteps didn't lie. It was all solid ground. Trembling, Jonah pushed forward and examined the doors. Life jackets and ring buoys. A horrific latrinal scene. A storage closet filled with things that could have been saved. And once again, across from that room, a door harboring the mysterious... Scratch. Scratch. With less hesitation this time, Jonah opened it. He laughed again at the second corridor clone sprawled out before him. It was a cyclic trap. One more like it and he'd go full circle, doomed to wander the ever-repeating lower decks of a plague ship until madness or dehydration took him down. Think, man, think, he whispered, slumping against the doorframe. If he completed the square loop and popped out into the original corridor he had first ascended the stairs into, there'd truly be no turning back. He figured he had to preserve the integrity of his starting point if he wanted any chance of leaving himself a potential out. Clues, Jonah muttered to himself. There's got to be something... The invisible scratching behind the one door had to hint at something... As much as he dreaded it, finding its source would be a change of pace, a step forward, if not a step in the right direction. Every time I open that door, it just leads me back to the start of the corridor, he recalled, pacing again. There's something I'm missing, another way to get through. Never in his life had he felt so small, so constricted and lost and confused on the precipice of damnation if he made one misstep. He wondered what Esteban was up to, probably scouring the boat and shouting for him, wondering where the hell his boss wound up. Really, though, Jonah could have just used the company. He scowled. He wasn't truly alone in the lower deck. The poor, fevered sucker in the fish hold was the closest thing to a warm body he would find. He regarded the thick, insulated door at the end of the hallway. The smell of rotten shrimp in his clothes seemed to intensify, as if daring him to try it again. But in a morbid way, the corpse knew more about the Job 2-7 than Jonah did. If the trail had gone cold, it ought to have ended with him. Jonah migrated to the storage closet and quickly found what he wanted first. 
The new flashlight gave him some comfort. He knew what to expect now, in and out, just like last time. He squared up outside the fish hold. He took a deep breath, switched the light on. He pulled the door open. Same reeking interior, same white insulated bins on the sides, same plague-ridden corpse prone against the far wall underneath the ventilation fans. Jonah wasted no time crossing over to the opposite end, scanning the body with his flashlight. Up close, his swollen glands were like inky pustules about to burst. The inside of his mouth was black, like he had imbibed a flagon of tar, but it was the object hooked to his belt loop that intrigued Jonah. A keyring the size of a tangerine, dangling with a collection of worn keys. Jonah drew his knife and cut through the fabric, lifting the jingling keys above him like some long-lost treasure. A cold, stinking breeze blew through the fish hold, and the door slammed shut again. Jonah jumped, but he walked towards it, knowing he only had a few moments to find the emergency release before... The bins blasted open, their lids crashing against the ceiling with a sound like a gunshot, and a billowing tornado of flies exploded from them. And suddenly the fish hold was a reverberating cacophony of buzzing and tiny, scratchy bodies buffeting Jonah's face and flesh. He yelped, gagging at the handful of flies he had accidentally breathed in. He retched, stumbling towards the door, his flashlight beam swinging wildly about the enclosed space, the millions of passing insect shadows like a light show at a hellish rave. Swatting and swinging his arms, Jonah pounded on the emergency release button, and the door spat him out onto the floor. He kicked the door shut, but at least a hundred of the angry fuckers had made it out. They scattered in a discombobulated mess, disseminating and filling the empty space inside the corridor. Jonah struggled onto all fours, gasping for breath, the key ring digging into his palm. Aside from the buzzing, there was a new sensation, one much closer to home, one infinitely more troubling. Before his eyes, tiny red itchy bumps swelled up on his wrists and forearms. He instantly knew their source, the realization coinciding with images of rats and ghost ships and plague doctors. Fleas, he hissed, scrubbing his flesh to dislodge the microscopic little germ bags, but he knew it was too late. Their saliva was in his blood, blood that was now incubating bubonic plague. Jonah rose to his feet, sorting through the keys with a trembling hand. Swear to Christ, if I get out of here, I'm getting an office job, he muttered. But not before getting a fucking warehouse's worth of shots. He turned to the final door, fidgeting against the rising itchiness, the scratching noises becoming anxious. The third key he tried on the keyhole worked. It clunked, and the door shifted on its hinges slightly. Once more, the scratching stopped. His patience razor thin, Jonah threw the door open. The new room was much smaller than he'd anticipated. It was a sick bay, a simple cot and nightstand cramped in a room barely large enough to lie down in. Yet, the cot was occupied by the fourth dead body Jonah had seen that day. This man had been dead a long while. He emitted no odor, and his blackened skin was dry and shriveled around his bones. Patient Zero, Jonah realized. They'd stowed him away down in the sick bay too late, not realizing what they were dealing with before casting out... The plague's rare enough as it is, Jonah thought, scratching himself. He remembered the reports of shrimp trawlers having to reach beyond their usual worker pool to garner a full crew. Odds of them picking up a contagious man in their search were small, but devastatingly so. 
Upon the nightstand sat a journal. Jonah picked it up and flipped through it, finding the most recent entry. Zero sign of improvement with Mr. Sullivan. His sleepwalking has worsened to the point of us having to lock the door to keep him isolated. I don't suspect he'll last the night. The bastards all but doomed us all. The disease, whatever it is, has spread among the crew in full. Sightings of ship rats continue. Suspect something viral spread among the vermin. Currently seeking to make port. Fever is unbearable. I'm having to take breaks in the fish hold with those glorious fans. Anywhere else is just too damn hot. Fingertips hurt. Glands sore. But the shrimp must be preserved. They must. It sobered Jonah, knowing he was cradling the words of a dead man in his hands. The Job 2-7 was a brewing, seaborn epidemic. In a way, Jonah was glad the trawler beached somewhere remote. God forbid if the plague ship with its fleas and rats and contaminated bodies ran aground anywhere else on the Florida coast. But none of it explained the maze, nor the impossible presence of creatures on the trawler. There's something more going on, said Jonah. I haven't found shit. The door slammed shut behind him. Jonah whipped around, startled but unsurprised at that point. He brandished the key and made to unlock it again, and stopped at the sight of long gash marks on the inside of the door. He raised his hand and lined up his fingertips with the gouges. Dragging his nails down the gouges, it produced an all-too-familiar scratching. Shit! He spat fumbling with the key ring. Behind him, leather cracked, cloth folded, and brittle bones produced twig-like snaps. Jonah felt eyes upon him, dead, dry eyes that could see without seeing. Jonah turned his head, granting the aberration only the slimmest corner of his vision. But even those optic scraps still told him the corpse, Patient Zero, Mr. Sullivan, was sitting up in his cot. Jonah's hand blindly swam about the door for the handle. The hinges had disappeared. The frame was gone. Everything about it was... gone. All that remained was a solid wall. Pity... The disembodied voice croaked. That you must share this space with us now. We hate that for you. Jonah pounded on the wall with painful despair, but his prison was a vacuum of solidity. Nothing was ever getting out again. They locked us in here to rot, it continued. This is all we knew. How long have you pushed through our prison, wondering if you would ever see the light of day again? Jonah could hear it smile. Now you know our agony. Delicious, is it not? Shut up, Jonah whispered, throwing his weight against the wall. Shut up. This is where your journey ends, it sneered, seeming to stand up. But don't think you have nothing left. We've been pining for something new. Gripped with dread, Jonah turned his head a bit more. The walking corpse was convulsing, its limbs spasming like an electrocuted frog. Its exposed flesh underneath its ragged clothes seemed to bulge. A dark cloud like a nanite swarm seemed to surround it. Communion, it garbled, and Jonah suddenly realized it wasn't one voice talking, but hundreds. The body bloomed with dozens of black tumors that protruded up from the skin. 
The dark cloud intensified, spreading to fill the sick bay entirely, and the itchiness erupted on Jonah again as he knew the cloud was actually millions upon millions of flies. The tumors emerged entirely, cascading and crawling down the crumpling corpse, and he saw that they weren't tumors at all, but nightmare black ship rats. Whatever remained of patient zero, Mr. Sullivan, collapsed into a pathetic heap. The congregation of mangy rodents, surrounded by their miniature fog bank of fleas, stared up at Jonah with their beady eyes. Partake, they said in chorus. Communion. Partake. They converged. It was late afternoon by the time Esteban had gathered enough men from the nearby town of Hell's Gulf. The group of two dozen or so had arrived with their own watercraft and equipment, eager to take a piece of the Job 2-7 for themselves. Esteban had made it clear that his primary concern was finding his boss, Jonah Daughtry, but three subsequent searches of the trawler, from the outriggers to the cabin to every room in the lower decks, confirmed the only other people on the ship had been her original crew, all dead for days at least. Those bodies were wrapped up in shrouds and shuttled off on the town sheriff's boat. As they milled through the ship like pillagers, Esteban sat by himself in a grim daze. Their skiff hadn't been launched away, and no footprints led away from the wreck, and he was 100% certain he hadn't seen Jonah emerge from the cabin. Over the next day, the Job 2-7 was slowly taken apart, her cargo salvaged and scrap metal torn away and shipped off. Esteban watched as the wreck became a rickety frame, then a pile of debris, and suddenly there was only a few bits of junk and a middling impression in the sand. Their work done, the townsfolk departed from the secluded beach, leaving Esteban with nothing but dark thoughts and half-memories. He tossed a seashell into the waves and meandered towards the skiff. He hadn't the scantest idea where he would go next, but wherever that was, he prayed it wouldn't be where Jonah was. You've been listening to The Plague Ship by Nick Carlson. Horror Hill listeners get a special discount when they buy the book Hell's Gulf on Temple Dark Books website, www.templedarkbooks.com, when they enter the code CHILLING20. Site visitors will also be offered a separate and non-combinable offer for 15% off when they sign up for their company's mailing list. What's more, you ask? We have five copies here at the network to give away to you for free. You heard me, free. Just send a quick email to natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com with the words Hell's Gulf, that's G-U-L-F, in the subject title line and state your interest in the body of the email. Winners will be chosen and responded to the morning of August 9th by 9 a.m. EST. For everyone else, Hell's Gulf will be officially available for sale starting August 6, 2022, and first copies will launch at Dublin Comic Con on the same day. That's right, folks. Temple Dark Books is an indie press based in Ireland that specializes in science fiction, fantasy, horror, and historical fiction. More or less anything you might want. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I'll see you right here at this time next week for more terrifying tales, sinister stories, and frightening fables. All that good stuff. If you enjoyed what you heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, 
and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, username Viking Guitar, and also on Instagram as Viking Guitar Productions. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I do take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure that you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.